Okay, thank you. Well, welcome here. I'm very happy that we are all here. Uh, some of us were already at the ceremony yesterday, and I think we all enjoyed it yesterday. It was a fun night. And today it's, an, you know, it's a more academic uh, format. And we'll have our panel with the young scholars who presented their work to us in the form of their uh, essays. And Joseph and I will kindly discuss these essays. Unfortunately, we're missing the third essay, The World of Walls. Uh, but Professor Nye could also say a few words on that if he wants to, because he already has the paper. That's by Maria Paz, who's currently at Stanford. But as I told you last night, she couldn't come because she broke her arm and her pelvis, unfortunately. Uh, now, most of my students here have already read Joseph Nye's Tremendous work, in and out. Hmm? You are already familiar with power and interdependence. You have written essays and your you know, uh, term papers, your questions in the midterms and the finals on soft power, smart power. So it's actually a great opportunity for us to hear all of that uh, from his uh, you know, person today after the panel is over. So we'll divide this into two parts. We'll have the presentation of the Young Scholars' work now, after which Professor and I will kindly discuss them. And then in the second half, we will have his presentation on uh, his work. So without further ado, I'd like to pass the floor to our panelists, but let me first introduce them. Uh, I'll start with uh, Kerim Can Kavaklı. Does any one of you know Kerim Can? <laughs> so we already have, you know, all of you, I think, in the audience, with few exceptions, I think, have taken Kerim John's classes while he was here. He was one of our first students, together with Zeynep Yulru, in the back. So out of six students, we had two of them in the audience here. He's a graduate of Sabanji University in 2003. Then he started his master's with us, actually, at Sabanji University. But at the end of his second semester, or at the even the beginning of his first semester, he said, no, I don't want to stay here. I want to go to the US. <laughs> he went to first Rice, and then from there, he transferred to Rochester. And when he finalized his PhD, he was you know, able to come back and work with us. And then at the beginning of this year, he moved to Bocconi. Uh, but he's, you know, a part of us, and he's always with us. Uh, Cosette Kremer is a young scholar currently at the University of Pennsylvania, is a lightning scholar, which, you know, I must actually tell you, is a very hard position to get by. It's a special program of the UPenn, to which, you know, a lot of people apply, and only a very few scholars are chosen for that position. It's a research position for one year. She is at the University of Minnesota, but while she, you know, she has her PhD from um, JD and PhD from Harvard University on WTO and judicial processes, some of the things that you will dis, you know, hear from her uh, this morning. Uh, but I, you know, from what I understand from her, she is rarely at the University of Minnesota. She is constantly you know, around the world teaching, doing research in different places. Um, and our third guest, of course, is Joseph Nye who is a former dean of the Kennedy School of Government and professor at uh, Harvard University still. And he's, you know, he has extensively worked on global governance, international relations, interdependence. And you know, something very interesting is that he also has his early work in corruption. So <laughs> we found that you know, there were these commonalities that even you know, economists and Joseph Nye's work had significant overlaps with the area of corruption. So I'll first give the floor to, if you don't mind, to Kerim Jan to present his um, paper, Does China, the Rise of China uh, Have an Impact on International Regimes, Evidence from anti Human Anti-Trafficking? So, Kerim Jan, 15 minutes. Okay. Uh, thank you again for, uh, for the award and for the opportunity to come back here and present to you uh, my new academic work. This paper is an intersection of two research agendas that I pursue. On the one hand, international uh, politics, the, the ways that countries 
use their power to compel each other toward different behaviors, and human rights. So the main research question that I, uh, I'm studying here is, what is the impact of great power rivalry, or at least uh, competition, on international cooperation? This is an important topic. Uh, well, it has historically been very important, but in the current era, it has regained its importance. After the Cold War ended, many people thought that the US was the predominant power, for, was going to be the predominant power for a very long time. It was in financial terms, economic terms, military terms, much more powerful than any of its competitors. So we felt that we were living in a unipolar area, in a unipolar era. However, in recent decades, in recent years, this has changed. China has emerged as a major power, as a major competitor to the US, and many people are now trying to understand how this change is going to affect international politics. Most of the research on this topic is about the possibility of war. Uh, historically, when two great powers coexist, or one of them is rising, we see that the probability of conflict and war between them also increases. What has been researched uh, less, relatively less, is how this rivalry, this competition, affects international cooperation. So this is the broader, the bigger topic that this uh, paper addresses. To give you a, a sense of what I'm trying to do here is, we can think of, of the international arena uh, as made up of different types of actors. Of course, all states are uh, sovereign. However, they greatly differ in terms of the capabilities that they have. So uh, in this uh, graph, what I wanted to show you is the differentiation between great powers, which are very few, and the small powers, okay, which are many. So most of the research that I mentioned a minute ago is about the relationship between great powers, so whether they are able to cooperate with each other. And there the research is quite clear. There are very good reasons to believe that if two great powers are competing, if two major powers are competing, their uh, probability, their ability to cooperate is greatly reduced. But we should also ask, how their rivalry, the bilateral relationship between great powers, affects their relations, their individual relations, with the smaller powers. We actually have a good theoretical framework to, uh, to, to structure our analysis. So we know that most uh, global problems, things like climate change, human trafficking, or um, addressing civil wars requires collective action by states. What does that mean? It means that these problems cannot be solved by any one country uh, alone. It requires the, the cooperation of many states. However, uh, this kind of cooperation, participating in that cooperation is costly. For instance, if Turkey wants to participate in the regime against climate change, it needs to uh, take certain actions, such as adapting its industries to greener technologies or um, changing its regulation so that industrial production, at least in the short term, becomes costlier. If collective action is costly, then we know that states or actors in general have incentives to free ride. Every actor has this shared interest, but they would each prefer other actors in the system to bear the real cost of cooperation. So for instance, Turkey would prefer that we deal with climate change, and so would China. However, Turkey would prefer that China pay most of the cost of uh, adapting, whereas China would at the same time prefer that Turkey bear most of the cost. If everybody tries to free ride and push the cost on other actors, then no action is taken and cooperation does, simply does not take place even though we all want the same thing. This is the problem of collective action. 
Great powers can help this solve this problem. What they can do is they can actually intervene and make free riding, ironically, costly. So for instance, a great power that gives a lot of financial aid to other countries can make the aid conditional on participation. So if the US gives a lot of aid to a country like Turkey and wants Turkey to change its environmental regulations, it can make this beneficial for Turkey by saying, well, if you adapt, you're going to keep getting this aid, whereas if you do not, if you try to free ride, we will cut aid so that the changes, the incentives for Turkey, a country, a smaller country like Turkey, changes. Now, here is where great power rivalry comes into, uh, into play. When one great power tries to make its help, its support conditional, if there is an alternative great power with similar uh, resources, the second great power can actually undermine the other's conditionality by saying, well, you don't actually have to play in this game. You don't actually have to uh, cooperate. I am willing to offer you an alternative source of funding. So in a way, the small powers can play one great power against another to avoid the, uh, the compliance and get the most out of, this, uh, out of this situation. They can avoid paying the cost of cooperation and still get the benefits. A, a classical example of this is during the Cold War when we uh, observed the, power, the rivalry between the Soviet Union and the US. These two countries uh, were actually very limited in their ability to influence their, uh, their allies' domestic politics. For instance, the US frequently found it very difficult to promote democracy because it, it recognized that during the Cold War, when the Soviet Union exists as an alternative financial military power, if you push one of your allies toward democratizing too much, they may actually leave the, the capitalist camp and move, switch to the communist side in order to keep their, let's say, authoritarian powers and still get the economic resources. So the answer to this question, uh, how does great power rivalry or whether it uh, rivalry affects uh, cooperation is, well, it depends whether, uh, it, whether one great power undermines another's conditionality, another's ability to push for cooperation. It depends on the, the relative sizes of the demands. One great power can undermine the other's uh, compellence if its demands are relatively smaller and cheaper for the recipient countries, the smaller countries. So this is the theoretical framework that I'm working with in this paper. And what I want to do is I want to analyze this more specifically in a case study. And the case I'm um, going to do this is, what I'm going to do is I'm going to test this framework by studying closely the international anti-human trafficking regime. This is a, a really good case to really try to anal analyze this, uh, these problems. First of all, it is a timely topic. Second, it actually presents a lot of these dynamics, these problems to collective action. Moreover, this is a regime, an international uh, area of cooperation where institutions are fairly new. So the problems are old, but the, the, the attempt to create an international answer, an international institution is new, which means that we don't have to worry about old institutions continuing. This is like a new and uncontaminated case for us to study as scholars. This area, uh, institutions in this area have emerged mostly since the uh, early 2000s. And the final advantage of this case study is while this, these institutions were being born, we also observed the rise of China as an economic power and a financial power and a diplomatic power in many countries. So we can look at this case closely to understand how China affects 
affected the development of this international regime. I have three main findings. I show that US criticism towards smaller countries in this area actually was quite effective. It played a big role in international cooperation. It compelled countries to improve their policies. It compelled them to combat human trafficking more effectively. I also show that this criticism by the US or these efforts were more effective, they were stronger when the US was able to merge its criticism, its reputational power with its financial or material power, so it's, its economic power. Lastly, to go back to the main issue I was, I'm interested in, I also look at whether these efforts by the US were less effective or this, uh, the, the effectiveness was weaker in countries where China had greater influence. And I find no evidence of that. So that is why I think the paper in general has this more optimistic uh, message, which says that even in a period of increasing great power competition, these great powers can separately address important international problems and compel small states to, to improve their policies. And they, these great powers can do that without necessarily undermining each other's efforts. So let me again give you a bit of context on, on uh, this anti-human trafficking regime. Like I said, one good reason is uh, we're living in an age of migration and a time when people are calling this actually, uh, you know, that this is a crisis, there's a big crisis of migration. So, uh, which, is a, which is very closely related to human trafficking. So this is a timely, perhaps policy relevant idea, uh, area. For my purposes as an academic, as a scholar of international relations, it has additional advantages. This is actually a good case, a difficult case of international cooperation because um, combating human trafficking is actually fairly costly for states to do. For instance, uh, it requires countries to make new laws, train new personnel, um, or find assistance, provide assistance for victims, which uh, without, it turns out, without external incentives, most countries are unwilling to do. One of the reasons for that is a lot of the victims of human trafficking are not citizens of the country where they are uh, hosted. So the governments that are responsible for their welfare do not really feel that responsibility. There is no electoral uh, accountability. Secondly, this is a case where the US clearly plays a leading role. One of the great powers clearly plays a big role. Um, in the US, to give you a very short timeline, in the US, the, uh, in, the, in 2000, the US made a major new law called the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. And one of the requirements of this new law in the US was uh, made by the Congress that it ordered the US government to publish annual reports on, on the performance of every country around the world in terms of combating human trafficking. So not only did the US uh, pledge to improve its own policies, but the US also started to publicly evaluate and grade other countries around the world in terms of how much they're uh, combating human trafficking. This is called the Trafficking Persons Report. And the, one of the very interesting things about this is what this report does is every year it puts every country in the world into one of four categories. These are called tiers. And in general, researchers have argued that if you are a country like Turkey and if you are put in tier one or two, this is good. It shows that you are a responsible actor in international politics. You are um, you know, doing your part in the, in the fight against human trafficking. However, if in an, in an annual report the US State Department lists you in the watch list or the, the bottom, the, uh, the third tier, then this is uh, a, reputa a stain on your reputation. It shows that you are the kind of country that does not respect or protect human rights, and it puts you into a group 
with other members that you may not be associated with. And I'll give you an example of that. So being placed in the watch list or tier three implies that a country is strongly and more importantly, publicly criticized by the US. Lastly, as I explained, this is a new regime and its birth coincides with the rise of China. So we can uh, observe how the regime evolved as China became more and more important. So specifically, what I want to answer is, has the rise of China weakened the US-led anti-trafficking regime? That is going to be my specific, uh, the specific thing I'm going to answer today. So based on this framework, I want to offer three main hypotheses. One is that countries that are listed in these bottom tiers will show greater improvement. They will try harder to improve their human trafficking policies in the next year, okay? So if you are in place in the, uh, in the bottom tier, this is kind of an embarrassing thing in the international arena. So you will try harder to get out to rise uh, above that uh, bottom, bottom group. The second hypothesis is the, the effectiveness of this criticism by the US will be greater if this is toward a country where the US has higher leverage. So a country that is dependent on US financial aid, diplomatic support, military aid, is going to be more affected. It's going to try harder to improve its, uh, its ranking relative to a more independent or a stronger actor who is less dependent on US support. Lastly, I have two competing hypotheses about the rise of China. Either, for the reasons I explained, the uh, Chinese influence over a country will actually weaken the effectiveness of US criticism, so this is the, the pessimistic hypothesis, or it will not have an effect. Okay? And I go into why you would actually, uh, under certain circumstances, not really ex uh, ex expect these two powers to intervene, to interfere with each other. So I do, how do I do that? Before I get into the, the, um, the quantitative side, let me uh, use the case of Turkey to illustrate some of these ideas. Turkey is actually a very interesting case in this, in this case study. Um, what has happened to Turkey is between 2001 and 2005, Turkey was first in, in the very bottom category, tier three, then it rose to the watch list, and only after 2005, Turkey was actually promoted to the second tier, okay? So for the first four years, between 2001 and 2005, Turkey was in that, let's say, embarrassing that category, but since then, Turkey has been in a more uh, acceptable position. Turkey has never been in the first tier, but it has actually made it to the second one, okay? So, I use in this paper a bunch of different kinds of evidence, and one of the things I show is that in the case of Turkey, we can pretty confidently say that US criticism played a big role and compelled Turkey to improve its policies. For instance, evidence shows that both governmental and non-governmental actors are very aware, I mean, not you and me, not the normal citizens, but the people who are, uh, for instance, NGOs or journalists or government officials are very much aware of the trafficking in persons report and Turkey's ranking in it. For instance, in 2003, one of the years when Turkey was in the bottom category, the Turkish interior minister, Abdülkadir Aksu, said, uh, gave a speech to uh, newspapers where he bitterly complained about Turkey's ranking. He said that Turkey's ranking in tier three is unfair. It overlooks Turkey's efforts. And moreover, this is important. He said that the fact that Turkey's name has been mentioned with countries that have failed to reach minimum standards shows that its developments have gone unnoticed. So what do we understand from this quote? Here the Turkish interior minister tells us that Turkey is not only uh, the 
the importance of this ranking is not only about showing what Turkey is doing, but Turkey also cares about what other countries are in its category. So what other countries are being compared or shown similar to Turkey? And if you are in, in tier three uh, with many other very authoritarian countries, this is embarrassing for a country like Turkey, which sees itself you know, somewhere in a developed area, um, you know, close to Europe and so on. So this is one piece of evidence. The second one I think is even more interesting. As you may know, uh, most diplomatic correspondence is in fact uh, confidential. For usually for 50 years, we don't know what the headquarters, the capital of a country and its diplomats say to each other. With one exception, a few years ago, a number of hackers were able to hack into the US State Department, the US government, and download and make public millions of correspondence between US diplomats around the world and Washington. So we know what the US diplomats said, what kind of diplomatic relations they had, what they reported, including reports from Ankara and Istanbul. So if you go to the WikiLeaks and read uh, reports from American diplomats in Turkey, they actually uh, tell people in Washington their, uh, their conversations with Turkish officials about this very issue. For instance, there is this one cable that I, uh, I cite in the paper where a high-ranking Turkish uh, official comes to the US Embassy and discusses how Turkey can improve its, its, uh, its ranking in the report. And he asks which, precisely which benchmarks are used in the report. So he doesn't simply ask, you know, what would you like us to do? But he says, we want a better score. What do we need to do to get a better score next year? And on top of that, he says, he complains, this Turkish official, it is frustrating to make these reforms and implement policies only be told, be told later that they are not sufficient. So this quote shows you Again, that Turkey is not, I mean, Turkey has improved its policies, but not only in the name of humanism, not only in the name of altruism, but Turkey did this with a specific diplomatic goal of earning a, a higher ranking, a better ranking, and escaping that embarrassing bottom tier, okay? We also see from these documents that US used its financial leverage over Turkey to compel these better policies. We know that they told journalists that without reforms, Turkey's uh, financial aid might be cut. We know that they told directly to Turkish diplomats that if Turkey doesn't maintain its reforms, sanctions might be considered. Okay? So this shows you that this mechanism of criticism is not only about reputation, it's not only about you know, what is being said on the newspaper, but it can, in, in fact, have financial material consequences for the country. Finally, in the case of Turkey, I find no evidence that China has played a role. So Turkey is one of those places where China has become more visible and more important over the years, but at least from my, in my research, I've, I do not see China playing a role. And of course, this doesn't mean that, you know, it, it, I cannot uh, confidently know that it didn't play any role, but given all this very varied evidence, we would think that if it, China was a factor, that if Turkish government thought, oh, maybe we should, you know, uh, uh, maybe we should abandon the U.S. or, you know, get less from U.S. and instead uh, move over to China as an alternative source. Well, this does not seem to have happened. Okay, but this is only a case study, okay? So it could be that I'm missing some things. Maybe this is not a generalizable case. So what I do in the main part of the paper is to actually conduct a statistical analysis. The unit of analysis is country year. So I have data for many countries over the period between 2000 and 2014. My dependent variable is this measure that was created by a number of German scholars at uh, Groningen. It's called the Anti-Trafficking Policy Index. It measures uh, how good a country's policies in this area are. 
it varies between 0 and 15. And I use this OLS estimator to analyze it. Now, my main explanatory variables is one of them is this variable I already mentioned. It's a, it's a binary variable. It measures whether a country in a given year is put in the bottom two categories or placed in the, in the top two categories. Now, the next variable is how much leverage a country has on, uh, I, how much leverage the US has on a country. To test my hypothesis, I need a measure of that. And I get this from a well-known political science um, uh, research, academic work, and it has three levels, and it's a fairly simple and um, uh, common sense uh, work. So we say that a country has, sorry, the US has low leverage over a country if that country is a major economy or a major oil exporter. So the idea is the US criticism on let's say Saudi Arabia or, the, uh, or Russia is not going to be very effective because these countries either are not very dependent on the US or if the US threatens to cut aid or support to them, it's not credible. The US is probably not going to uh, harm its relations with a major power, a major economic power, just because it is not protecting human rights victims. We have this medium category, which, is a, uh, which covers countries that are medium-sized economies or recipients of major US military aid. And the US has, in this analysis, is coded to have high leverage if a country fits none of these criteria. So if you're not a major economy, if, you don't have, if you're not a major oil exporter or a US military aid recipient, then the US probably has uh, high levels of leverage over you. So what do I find? Oh, and I have a bunch of uh, control variables. So let me first show you whether the US ha seems to have an effect, and then I will move on to the effects of China. So the first main finding is that US criticism works. Uh, I find that if you take two countries that are otherwise similar, but one of them is in the, in the low category, so it, is, it receives that criticism, whereas the other one doesn't, the country that was criticized by the US, holding everything else constant, improves its policies by about 0 0.23, okay? Now, this is, of course, an abstract number, but in terms of the index, it is actually fairly sizable. So it is one of the larger effects that we see in the analysis. In contrast, if you take a country that is very similar, but did not get uh, did not, was not criticized by the US, the diff, it, it increased, it's still, there is an on average increase, but it's only about 0 0.1. And the difference is what we call statistically significant, which means that it's probably not due to chance. Okay? So this is the one, the first thing. But I argued that the effect of criticism is conditional on US leverage. So I run this other analysis where I estimate the effect of criticism for different levels of US leverage. And here you see the analysis. The important thing is, there is a red line on this graph, a horizontal red line. It is the line that says, uh, that uh, represents zero effect, okay? So if one of my estimates actually overlaps with that zero line, it means that I as, an, as a researcher cannot say with confidence that there is any effect. Okay? And what you see here is the effect of criticism is positive and um, above the zero line only if US, U.S. leverage is high, so the, the bar on the right-hand side. So what does that mean? It means that according to my analysis, when, a, when a, the U.S. has low leverage or medium levels of leverage, on those countries, US criticism does not really make a difference. It's only where the US has high leverage, so these countries that are more dependent or vulnerable to external intervention, that this is where criticism uh, leads to an improvement in anti-trafficking policies. Okay, so the last part of the paper is, what about Chinese influence? Well, I, find, I told you that my finding is, it, I did not find any evidence, but how did I arrive at that conclusion? 
So I needed to, for this uh, paper, create a new measure of Chinese influence. And I tried a number of different things. We don't have in the academic literature a well-known established measure of Chinese influence. So what I did is I, I uh, created a number of alternative measures and tried to, tried to use them all in different variations of the analysis and see if the results are consistent, okay? And that is the case. So my main measure actually captures China's economic influence. It measures, it's based on how much a country trades with China or how much Chinese finance a country receives. Um, and, what I, and my alternative measures, which I'm not going to show you today, but they are in the, in the paper, are based on China's other forms of influence, such as, for instance, the Confucius Institutes that are in universities also in, the, in Turkey, and uh, UN voting patterns. I'm going to skip this. So what I want you to do is, uh, when you look at these graphs, um, I try to make it as uh, easy to see the results as possible. What I want you to notice is that these two graphs are in fact fairly simple. In both graphs, so the one on the left shows you the estimates for countries where China has low influence. The right hand side shows you the countries where China has high influence. And the important thing, the main finding is in both cases the patterns are very similar. In both cases, you see a sizable increase in improvement only when U.S. leverage is high, okay? So regardless of Chinese influence, okay, whether China's influence is low or China's influence is high, what we find is U.S. criticism leads to better trafficking policies if U.S. leverage is high, and China's influence does not weaken this leverage, the effectiveness of this criticism or the leverage. Uh, the paper has some more sophisticated analyses to test if these results are actually fairly simple, and it turns out they are. Okay? So, Great. to conclude, what I did is, I analyzed how the international trafficking regime developed under US leadership, and whether China's rise had a, actually a weakening effect. I found that US leadership played a significant role in improving these policies, and I found that the effect is stronger where the US had higher leverage. So this much we know from standard IR theory. Probably most interestingly, I did not find any evidence that in this period on this issue area, China's rise as an, uh, China's emergence as an alternative source of economic and diplomatic power weakened the US's efforts to improve policies, which means that even in a uh, period of increasing competition, these two great powers can uh, help cooperation, international cooperation, without really interfering with each other's efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Okay, just a second. Just a second. Okay, now in academic terms, 15 to 20 minutes actually turns out to be 35 minutes. Oh, <laughs> sorry about that. And you didn't look at this way at all. Uh, <laughs> while Kerim Jan was talking, we actually had a group of visitors from Tevitor High School. So I'd like to welcome them as well. Welcome here, we're very happy to have you. Um, and before I pass the floor to Cosette, let me just add one final thing. Uh, those of you who were at yesterday's ceremony would, you know, they already have heard this, but we were a jury of seven people uh, composed of international and national scholars, and we received about 30 papers. Those papers did not come to us with their names. So for us, uh, Cosette's paper is number 17, Kerim John is number 16, and Moira is number 10. And we read, when we read the 30 papers, the Public Relations Office only gave us the names of the three papers that we have chosen, and we don't know who the others are. Mm -hmm. So it's in, in this case, it's not double blind, it's seven times blind. Uh, seven blind people read the papers. So we only knew who the people were, you know, who, who the recipients were, after we picked the papers. And I'll turn the floor to Cosette for her presentation on the uh, judicial responsiveness of the WTO. And let's say 20 minutes stops. <laughs> 
pretty loud anyways. <laughs> a big part of my research focuses on a specific set of legal institutions that exist at the global level, and that's international courts or international judicial or quasi-judicial bodies. And I try to explain and understand the politics that really underpin or underlie how these legal institutions behave, how they make their rulings. Um, and what I'll present today in the essay that was selected for this award is part of a larger book project that I have that tries to explain the politics underpinning the settlement of disputes at the World Trade Organization. Um, I'm only going to, within this talk, focus on developing the theoretical argument of the book project and the paper, and then a really small part of the empirical um, analysis contained within the paper. So I'll try to stick to my 20, 15, 20 minutes. Okay. So as many of you know, anyone who reads the newspapers knows, um, one of the pinnacle institutions of the post-war liberal order is facing an existential crisis. And this is a phrase that's been uh, tossed around to explain what's facing the international trade order, the global trade order right now. The multilateral trading system that was established by the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade following the end of the Second World War, and then replaced in 1995 by the World Trade Organization, is really under um, strain on a number of fronts. For the first time in history, last December, in two, uh, last December in Buenos Aires, Argentina, the G20 countries that met there issued a communique that publicly recognized that the multilateral trading system was falling short, that was really failing to live up to its objectives, to its goals and that the World Trade Organization in particular was in need of reform. One dimension of this global trade crisis concerns what's called the WTO's dispute settlement system. This is often the dispute settlement system of the World Trade Organization is often referred to as the jewel in the crown of that body, of that organization. And this is a system, right, that's set up to basically do, you know, what its name says, settle disputes, trade conflicts between countries. And it has settled a vast number of trade disputes or conflicts between countries since it was established um, and effectively prevented trade conflicts from escalating into other types or other forms of conflicts. So the, the dimension of this crisis that concerns the WTO's dispute settlement system um, arises from the fact that the current U.S. administration has been blocking appointments of the, effectively the judges of this world trade court. And these are individuals who are selected by WTO member governments to sit in Geneva uh, on what's called the appellate body of the World Trade Organization. And they're selected right, to rule on and issue judgments or rulings on how trade disputes or trade conflicts between countries should be resolved. There's supposed to be seven individuals who sit at any one given time on the appellate body. Last May, that was down to six because reappointment and appointment of new individuals are being blocked by the, WTO, uh, by the US within the WTO. These six individuals of the appellate body were left in May. Now there's only three. By the end of this year, if the US continues to block appointments of new judges for the World Trade Court, there will be not enough judges left. Three is the minimum judges that uh, need to be there to rule on a dispute. This will effectively paralyze the dispute settlement system that exists to help countries resolve their trade conflicts. So many have referred to this crisis um, as one of a number of new crises that we're now facing within international trade law. And part of what I demonstrate within my essay is that a number of the concerns that with the dispute settlement system, with this world trade court that gave rise to the current US administration blocking appointments, these aren't actually new concerns. These are concerns with how this world trade court has been exercising its authority that have been voiced by a number of US administrations across the pol political spectrum. And I won't go into details about what these concerns are or the evidence that I, um, that I leverage to show that these aren't new. Uh, that's within the essay. I'm happy to talk about this more during Q&A. But not only are these the concerns that gave rise to the current crisis um, not, not, are not new for the, for the current US administration, but they're also not unique to the United States. A number of governments have consistently voiced criticism and concern with how the World Trade Court, the judges sitting on this World Trade Court, are exercising authority. These long-standing concerns with the WTO's judicial system arose effectively because countries, the member governments of the WTO, 
fail to collectively govern the legal order they created and, and, and issue new trade rules or reform the dispute settlement system. In the words of the European Union Trade Commissioner Cecilia Malmström last fall, the world has changed, the WTO unfortunately has not. So scholars of international courts like to distinguish um, between what they call resistance to or criticism of a court uh, from, from more severe forms of backlash. Resistance, criticism, vocal expressions of criticism are seen as somewhat, you know, a normal part of the politics of international courts. Here in the context of the WTO, what's been this simmering resistance, discontent, and oftentimes vocal criticism of the World Trade Court has now manifested in backlash in the form of blocking appointments to the appellate body. And it's really brought concerns with the system as a whole, with the World Trade Organization, and its legitimacy to a head. So in this talk, what I'm going to do um, and is to focus on some of the strategies that international courts and the, the court of the World Trade Organization in particular, some of the strategies that they can adopt to respond to government criticism or dissatisfaction. The broader project asks when or under what conditions do we see international judges, international judicial bodies responding to concerns and criticism from governments. What I'm going to try to convince you of today is that we can identify the conditions under which international courts provide greater deference, are more responsive, exercise greater judicial restraint vis-a-vis uh, -vis national governments by looking to a court's dual political and legal environments. So this is, I'm not, this is not a new claim at all, that a little bit of politics matters, that a little bit of law matters. I see the contribution of my project as specifying in a particular institutional context when and why each matters. So what I'll show you today is that since its creation in 1995, member governments have relied on, primarily on diffuse rhetorical pressures to signal support for or criticism of the World Trade Organization's exercise of judicial authority. And they do this through sort of expressions of voice, through public statements that they make on the record. I'll demonstrate that the WTO's uh, judges have deftly managed this simmering discontent and, and vocal criticism for nearly two decades and under certain conditions have responded to it right, by signaling greater judicial responsiveness and judicial restraint. After discussing how um, the WTO's adjudicative bodies have done this, have sought to address government dissatisfaction, I'll, I'll, I'll do this by drawing on, and the paper draws on a range of qualitative and quantitative evidence to, to support this argument. I'll only uh, sort of provide an overview of some of it today. But after doing this, I'll conclude by focusing on some of the, the implications that my findings have for, for addressing the current crisis facing the World Trade Organization and for reform of the system moving forward. Okay, so before I get into my argument, um, let me tell you a little bit about how disputes work within the WTO. So if one country has a problem or thinks that the trade policy or law or regulation of another country somehow violates international trade rules, right, it can initiate a dispute within the World Trade Organization. It can uh, sort of file this dispute. And then confidential negotiations occur between the two governments. Through these negotiations, they try to settle it diplomatically. The WTO um, officials can oftentimes help mediate these negotiations. But after a set period of time, if they haven't resolved their disputes, uh, the government that sort of initiated the, the trade dispute in the first place can request that a, a dispute panel is established. And dispute panels are sort of like the fir courts of first instance uh, within the World Trade Organization. Dispute panels are made up of three individuals and they're selected by either the countries to, this, to the dispute or the WTO's officials to really only rule on that dispute. So they're ad hoc, right? They're not permanent judges, so to speak. They're ad hoc though a number of them have sat on numerous dispute panels. So these, these three panelists, they sit up there in Geneva, they hear oral arguments from both sides, they you know, read the written pleadings of both parties, of third parties, and then they issue a ruling. And in doing this, they're, uh, they're assisted uh, in sort of the legal research and the drafting of this ruling by what's called the Legal Affairs Secretariat of the WTO. These are basically like the civil servants of the World Trade Organization. They're career lawyers who've been in Geneva you know, since the WTO's inception for, the, uh, for a large number of them. And they're really experts in WTO law and rules and how this dispute settlement process works. And they oftentimes, at the panel level at least, really facilitate 
the writing of the ruling. So these dispute panels then issue a ruling and say, okay, these aspects of your trade laws, they violate WTO rules, these are okay though, you can keep these in place. And if either party isn't satisfied with the ruling, they can appeal to sort of the court of second instance within the WTO, what's called the appellate body. And this is the, the, the part of the system that's really facing pressure and crisis right now. And similarly to the panels, the appellate body is assisted in its tasks of hearing, of doing the legal research and the drafting of these rulings by a separate appellate body secretary. And again, these, like the legal affairs secretariat, these are civil servants of the organization. So another big function of the secretariat of the World Trade Organization is to also help member governments. So member governments um, of the World Trade Organization uh, are sort of tasked with administering the dispute settlement system. And so there's a political body made up of every single member country of the WTO called the Dispute Settlement Body, or the DSB. I know it's confusing, there's a lot of acronyms. But the DSB is the member governments themselves. It's political bodies. They're the ones who approve the rulings, the reports. They're the ones who establish the panels. And they meet on a monthly basis uh, for about, all, usually it's typically a one-day session, and they issue statements about their views on, on the rulings, whether they thought that they were good rulings, whether they thought that the appellate body was overstepping its authority, engaging in judicial activism. And within, these, uh, within the DSB, within this political body, the legal affairs secretariat is sitting there taking notes, transcribing all the statements, as well as the appellate body secretariat. And they're listening to what the member governments are saying about how the judges have been um, exercising their authority. So that's a really quick overview of how the dispute settlement system within um, the WTO works. Once the appellate body has issued its ruling, it's final. It's automatically adopted by the, the member governments within the DSB. They can sort of stand up and say, we completely disagree with what the appellate body did in this case. And they often do. And the secretariat are listening right, to what's being said and transmitting that information back to the judges and the panelists themselves. So my argument, um, in brief, is, that, is that, the, that governments, instead of formally trying to control or influence the judges of the World Trade Organization, primarily rely um, on more informal mechanisms of influence. They use these expressions of voice, standing up within the dispute settlement body and issuing these public statements criticizing uh, or, or providing support for the rulings themselves as a way of, of trying to informally influence or signal their dissatisfaction for or support for, their dissatisfaction with or support for the court's exercise of authority. And governments use these statements made on the record to do so. And this step of the argument um, was supported with interviews that I conducted with a representative sample of WTO member state delegates in Geneva. Um, one government representative of a relatively large country that uh, has been involved in a, in a large number of disputes stated that despite what the black letter lawyers think, there's a political organization here. This isn't just a you know, rule of law court. It's a, a political organization as well. And member control is occurring, not in some sort of formal way, but through DSB meetings and through the statements that governments are making within the dispute settlement body. Another representative said that these statements are a way to send them a concrete message, to send signals to these judges that they might be stepping outside of their boundaries a little bit, and that that's the right way to send them a message, as opposed to, for instance, going and not calling them up and trying to engage in more ex parte communication. Second, I argue that the panelists, the judges, and the appellate body members as well as the secretary, the, the civil servants of the organization, they're paying attention to these signals. They're, they're listening, they're sitting in the dispute settlement body listening to what governments are voicing. And this step in my argument was also supported uh, within interviews with WTO secretariat officials, former panelists, and former appellate body members. One secretariat official stated that there was, is a message here, that these statements aren't just you know, cheap talk within, you know, within the, the, the sort of halls of Geneva that there's a message, and depending on how important or sensitive the issue is, the dispute settlement mechanism, the panelists, the secretariat, and the appellate body judges will take it into account. The secretariat officials are officially, are physically sitting in the room listening to these statements, right? And so the brain has taken it in, and these signals and these messages are being conveyed back to the judges themselves. <coughs> 
so given this, um, I argue that as strategic political actors, that the, the judges of the World Trade Organization are both strategic political and strategic legal actors. As strategic political actors, they really want to build up their political support or their institutional support. They're sensitive to shifts in their political capital, and they seek to maximize it when possible. So political capital within the essay and within the broader book project is a phrase that I use to refer to basically the overall level of support vocalized or expressed or voiced by governments within the World Trade Organization. As, as strategic legal actors, and I'll focus on the first level of panels in this talk today, as strategic legal actors though, right, they're not only sensitive to shifts in political support or institutional support, but they don't want to be overruled. They don't want to be smacked down by the appellate body judges and say, no, you got the law wrong. So they also pay attention to what appellate body, what the sort of court of appeals um, case law is. They don't want to be overruled. That ruins a reputation in, in specific ways. And then finally, the secretariat, who is assisting in sort of the drafting of these rulings and deciding whether or not a trade measure violates WTO law or not, the secretariat really wants, wants governments to comply with these rulings, right? It, it wants, when these rulings are issued, that governments don't just go home and ignore them. And the vast majority of WTO rulings are actually complied with and implemented back home domestically by governments. So the Secretariat tries to ensure compliance, so is, is, is really sensitive to, to what governments are thinking about how the, court, the World Trade Court itself is issuing its rulings. And in that way, right, Secretariat officials are also um, paying attention to, the, to this degree of institutional support or political capital. But they also want to ensure predictability, because this is a legal system. Right. And one of sort of the fundamental characteristics of a legal system is that it's supposed to ensure predictability and stability and certainty. And so for this reason, secretariat officials right, are trying to pay attention to both the sort of the political murmurings going on within the WTO, as well as to what the law is on the books, what the appellate body case law is. So this generates a number of testable implications and expectations. One is that as governments become collectively much more critical right, of how the court is, is issuing its rulings, that we would expect within its rulings for these judges to be much more responsive and to exercise judicial restraint in specific ways. So I'm not going to go into the details of how I measure these things. I code all of the rulings of the WTO, which I, anybody who studies international trade law, you know is like 400 pages. Each of these rulings is like 400 pages long. It's fascinating bedtime reading. I code all of these rulings um, for degrees of judicial for, and assign each a score of judicial responsiveness or restraint. And this is basically a score that captures the extent to which a particular ruling really tries to defer to or accommodate national governments in that specific case. In terms of political capital or the sort of this idea of, of expressions of voice or criticism, I, I take all of the statements made by member governments within the dispute settlement body and using both qualitative um, uh, content analysis as well as non-parametric automated content analysis, I classify these statements according to whether they're critical of the court's exercise of authority supportive of it, neutral or other. And I'm happy to talk more during Q&A how exactly I did this. <coughs> I also expect though, remember I said that there's a dual legal and political environment here. I also expect that, that the extent to which there's dense case law around a given topic or around a given issue, that this will moderate the influence of shifts in political capital and pattern ways. I expect that, a pan a panel, that if a panel is ruling on an issue where there is relatively more appellate body case law, the secretary will really push it to try to align its ruling with that case law and to pay less attention to what member governments are saying. So in this way, legal constraints really serve to moderate the influence of political capital on a pan panel's exercise of judicial restraint. And again, during q and I'm happy to talk more about how I, I, I sort of developed this measure of appellate body case law to capture this idea of legal constraints. So because I'm primarily interested in the moderating influence of uh, legal constraints, I interact within standard OLS models. I interact this uh, measure of political capital uh, in terms of criticism itself with the appellate body case law score. And I include within sort of a battery of models that I'm happy to talk about during Q&A, a number of control variables that capture what scholars of international courts and international judicial institutions tend to think 
uh, affect judicial behavior. And I find um, that criticism is consistently and positively associated with higher responsiveness. That as criticism in increases, panels become much more responsive to um, responsive to, to that within their, within their rulings. They seem to be signaling greater restraint as a membership as a whole becomes relatively more critical. So this is a marginal effects plot that um, sort of plots out the interaction between legal constraints and political capital for panel rulings. And it shows the relationship between criticism, uh, the y-axis, and a re re report's responsiveness score, which is the solid line here, at different levels of appellate body case law um, on the x-axis. And you can see that as as sort of when panels are issuing rulings, as the case law around that issue right, increases, as it becomes more dense, panels are signaling great lesser judicial restraint, right? Um, even as, even at higher levels of, um, of political criticism or political cap, or yeah, even at greater levels of criticism on the part of members. So this finding does suggest that sort of as appellate jurisprudence and as the case law begins to accumulate for these frequently litigated provisions, panels are beginning to pay much less attention to what governments are saying and paying much less attention to whether or not their political capital is decreasing. So these findings suggest that uh, panels are effectively using their rulings on issues with less appellate body case law to provide governments with greater flexibility through this greater responsiveness or restraint. And in this way, the, the dispute panels of the WTO have, until now, helped to address a primary institutional design concern. How do we balance greater legalism, greater rigidity in terms of formal legal rules, with continued adaptability of this global regime? However, the findings also show that this, the moderating effect of legal constraints suggests that for these most litigated provisions, um, the disputes at the World Trade Court is providing greater predictability and certainty at the expense of long-term adaptability. This might not be problematic, and it hasn't until recently be, been problematic, so long as the balance achieved between these, between sort of the, the legal rules aspect and predictability aspect of it and the flexibility aspect of it um, sort of uh, uh, reach a balance that governments as a whole are satisfied with. It also suggests that as appellate jurisprudence and case law develops, right, over time, the WTO's World Trade Court is going to become much less responsive to the expressed views of members and to criticism. And that's what we, what we see uh, with this recent crisis facing the WTO's appellate body. I'm going to skip over that implication of it. But in terms of a report, the current crisis facing the appellate body and the dispute settlement mechanism and sort of the implications of my finding for how to reform this system, um, my findings suggest that, in that, that, that reforms are needed to really enhance that feedback mechanism, to enhance the ways in which the judges themselves can be responsive to changing member needs and preferences, and to really sort of institutionalize this responsiveness between the WTO's political membership and its judicial bodies in a way that at least does not threaten the independence of the judges themselves. Well, that, I'll end it. Okay. Um, we'll pass the floor to Professor Nye for his comments. And maybe we should not divide this into two parts. So because we are you know, running out of time, you can give the comments and then have your talk on the rest of the uh, framework. Thank you. So the floor is yours. Wherever you like. You can sit perfectly fine. Okay, good. Uh, let me say congratulations to both of the authors for really fine papers. These are uh, first rate, and when I read them, I also didn't have uh, the names, but I did say to my wife and to myself, this is really excellent work. So it's nice to see the faces and people who go with the, uh, with the anonymous papers which deserve the prizes they received. Uh, let me just say a word or two about the significance of the papers rather than getting into the detailed uh, criticisms. Uh, 
about a, a year ago, um, I was at the International Studies Association meetings, as I believe you were too, Milton. And I was listening to my friend John Mearsheimer, noted realist, um, who gave a uh, uh, obertur dictum or a, a ex cathedra statement saying that the liberal international order is over. And it's over because every normative order in world politics depends on great powers. And the difference today is that there are three great powers in Mearsheimer's telling, uh, the US, China, and Russia. And two out of the three great powers are illiberal. Therefore, the liberal international order is over. I found this quite inadequate reasoning. And uh, it's not that I'm opposed to realism. I think we often get too hung up on these labels when we study international politics. Uh, in fact, uh, I have taken to calling myself a liberal realist, just so people don't pigeonhole thoughts one way or the other. Realism is the right place to start, which says there is no international government, therefore states are reliant upon their own uh, resources for self-defense, and that's a very good place to start for a lot of issues that relate to survival. But a lot of international politics is not about survival, as we've seen from these two cases. And what's more, the trouble with realism is not that it's a good place to start. It's that so many of the realists start and stop there. In other words, having, having said, uh, you know, you, you go back to Thucydides, and Thucydides has a, a famous Melian dialogue in which the inhabitants of the island of Milos are pleading with the Athenians to spare them, not to slay the men and take the women and children into slavery. And they appealed to justice. And the famous quote in Thucydides is, the strong do what they will, and the weak suffer what they must. Well, in certain extreme cases, that happens. Next door in Syria is unfortunate example. So it's not that this is totally out of the question. But the trouble with it is that much, indeed most of international politics, is not like that. So if you take the cases of trade and law, or you take the cases of trafficking, uh, the Melian dialogue and realism doesn't help you much. Helps a little bit, as I'll come back to in a minute. But the point is that realism is a good place to start, but the trouble with the the simplistic realists is they mistake their model for the world. And the world is much more complex than that. And that's why we have other supplementary models of liberalism and constructivism and so forth. So I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not opposed to realism per se, but I've spent a lot of my career, my work trying to demonstrate that uh, in fact, other aspects, norms, and institutions matter. Uh, in fact, I'm writing a book now which is going to be published at the end of the year by Oxford University Press, and I put the title on it, Do Morals Matter? Question mark. And the subtitle is Presidents and Foreign Policy from Franklin Roosevelt to Donald Trump. Uh, and what I try to do is look at historical case studies of the 14 presidents who have been in office since uh, the so-called liberal international order was started after World War II and ask, can you show historically where moral judgments made a difference? And my case studies show you can. So the realists who say, oh, it's all just a matter of interest and all this morality stuff is icing you pour on the cake to make it look pretty, but the real cake is baked by hardcore interests, you're going to get history wrong. 
And when the book is published, I hope I'll be able to demonstrate that with case studies. But in any case, that will explain to you why I was so pleased by reading Karim Kavakli's paper, because basically uh, he says the opposite of Mearsheimer, which of course is what Ike would say. Uh, so when he says, my findings give reason for optimism about the future of global governance, they indicate that unless great power rivalry between China and the US escalates into a zero sum competition, the two great powers can coexist and make independent contributions to global governance. That's a very, very important conclusion. So the significance of this paper deals with something which is uh, uh, going to determine the kind of world we live in. Uh, so I hope his paper is correct. Uh, and if I look at, uh, I also like the fact, if you go to uh, page three of the paper, where he says, uh, my most novel finding is a combination of two types of influence. Countries are influenced by ideational as well as material incentives. Uh, in other words, it's not just that the Americans twisted arms by threatening cut off aid, though they did, and he shows that, but also the ideas mattered, that uh, the, the persuasion about ideas mattered. So it takes both, if you want, hard and soft power, uh, and they both are part of creating this. Now, I think what, that, what I would say is uh, summarizing that, relating it back to theories of international relationship, uh, is that all three theories that we teach, these big theories, realism, liberalism, constructivism, all three are relevant. The question is to know how relevant in what circumstances. And that's why good empirical work like this is so important. Because it's not you know all realism or all constructivism. You want to understand how and under what conditions. And that's an empirical job. And this paper is a very good example of how one should approach this. So my congratulations on that. Uh, I have similar high praise for uh, Cosette's, uh, Creamer's paper. Uh, it, uh, when she talks about uh, political capital and courts, there's a larger question of politics and courts. Uh, indeed, I suspect that people living in Turkey today would be acutely aware of this. Uh, but let me take an American example, since I don't know enough about Turkey. In the history of the United States, uh, there was a famous judge in the early days named John Marshall. And John Marshall decided that the Supreme Court of the United States would have the right to overrule the legislature and the executive if he felt that a case went against the Constitution. Uh, that's not written that way in the US Constitution. But Marshall interpreting the Constitution that way set a tremendously important precedent. And that's why the Supreme Court has had such a powerful role in American politics. But even with the Supreme Court in the United States, you have to realize that uh, it's a matter of degree. They're not totally divorced from politics. And for example, in, uh, I think it was 1830, though, uh, Cosette can correct me on the date on this, uh, John Marshall came down with a decision about a, so an action that President Andrew Jackson had taken against uh, the Cherokee Indian tribe. And uh, basically, Marshall said that Jackson's, President Jackson's behavior was unconstitutional. And President Jackson said, John Marshall has his decision, now let him enforce it. In other words, the executive branch still has the power of enforcement. And so even when you have a strong court and a strong judge like Marshall, 
you still have to think about the fact that executives have the power of coercion. And if you look at the United States Supreme Court today, uh, it's interesting to notice that the Chief Justice, John Roberts, who is noted as a very conservative justice, has moved slightly to the center as the court as a whole has moved somewhat to the right. And his concern, for example, when he uh, voted with the more liberal members of the court to support Obamacare uh, when it came before the Supreme Court was to preserve the legitimacy of the court, which goes to Cosette's point about the political capital of the court. Now, I give you this example from domestic politics of a country which has a very powerful tradition of law and courts to illustrate that when you then take that to international politics, as Cosette has done with this interesting case of the WTO, uh, you're in a much more difficult situation of trying to understand the relationship of politics and courts or politics and adjudication. That as she properly says in her paper, uh, in the WTO, the dispute settlement mechanism is the crown jewel. If you compare the World Trade Organization with its predecessor, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade was quite limited. It was a bargaining process among governments, and there was no independent judicial role, and the WTO added this uh, a particular crown jewel, and it was an interesting step forward in international politics in what many people have called the legalization of international politics, or intruding law into more and more international politics. Some people, many liberals, applaud that, that we'd like to see an international politics governed by law. Others say, look, that's not the way the world is. States are sovereign, and they're not going to give up the degree of authority to an international body, which this implies. What I found particularly interesting in her paper was that for two decades, the judges by anticipating some of these problems, we're able to uh, smooth over the questions. As she points out in her paper, uh, uh, governments will agree in their uh, trade agreements to some general propositions. But when it comes to actual cases, there are lots of ambiguities. And the ambiguities then are settled in cases that go before the dispute settlement mechanism and eventually some of them reach the appellate board. Uh, but the question is when and how far does this adjudication that occurs become legislation? And the complaint by many of the sovereign states is look, you've come down with the judicial ruling, but that's not what I agreed to when I signed this trade agreement. Uh, this is no longer adjudication. This is legislation by judges, and therefore I don't accept it. And in the past two decades, as she shows so nicely in her paper, the judges were able to smooth this over. But even before Donald Trump, there was a problem beginning to arise about whether the appellate body or the judicial procedures as a whole were doing too much legislation. And then enter Donald Trump, and you have that wonderful picture she showed of the empty chairs. Well, Trump is basically emptying the chairs on purpose. And it's partly Trump, but it's also Trump's special trade representative, uh, Lighthizer, who is a trade lawyer. Uh, Trump doesn't understand or know much uh, about trade. Lighthizer does. 
He's a very skilled and practiced trade lawyer. And Lighthizer would say, and has told Trump, uh, this body has gotten out of control. They're legislating and committing us to things which we never agreed to. And that's not what we thought we were getting into. And that then explains those, those empty chairs that we saw. It's a deliberate strategy, as she says in the paper, to starve the organization so they can no longer play this role. Now, the, there is a potential solution to this, which uh, she describes near the end of her paper, uh, page 31 and 32, in which she says, if you reinvigorate the political oversight, that's central to the overdue institutional rebalancing. It requires further clarification and guidance from the membership as a whole on the mandate and approach to adjudication. This could be accomplished through the formal amendment of dispute settlement rules or an authoritative interpretation, particularly of those provisions that outline the DSM's mandate. In the long term, this will be necessary, but it likely will not occur in the near term without resort to voting. Now, that means that we're in a situation of uh, a great unpredictability. You can imagine a solution to this problem, uh, but you don't know how Donald Trump will respond to it. And Trump is an extremely unpredictable political actor. Uh, we've never had a president who's quite as unpredictable as he is, a very different type of man. He's a president who came into office. The first job in politics he ever held was as president, and he reached it at age 72 with absolutely no experience in uh, international politics, and yet there he is. Um, so how will Trump respond? Is this a bargaining ploy in which after certain adjustments are made, uh, he will start to fill some of those empty chairs? Or will he say, no, I just as soon wreck the institution? And frankly, at this stage, I don't know how to predict how that will turn out. And that should be a reminder to us that when we get too enamored of our ability in international relations theory and si social science to make predictions, there are always are surprises in history. And the surprises often can come down to the idiosyncrasies of individuals. Unlike a nice physics laboratory where barring the uncertainty principles that uh, go along with quantum physics, nonetheless, we have pretty good idea of how the atoms are going to behave. But when we deal with humans in political relationships, particularly at the level of international states, frankly, we don't know how these individuals are always going to behave. So the paper is a very nice exploration of the problem of political capital and uh, courts as applied internationally but it comes out properly with a great uncertainty. So both of these papers are really first-rate jobs of social science, and they've taken us about as far as we can go, and now we have to um, uh, maybe uh, say our prayers or say inshallah. Yeah. So those would be my comments and congratulations on the, on the papers. Now, did you want me to say something about uh, uh, the liberal international order more generally? Um, let me, uh, I, I don't want to say too much or take too long because uh, people's uh, patience will be exhausted. But uh, if we think about what is happening to the liberal international order, which both of these papers properly raise questions about. Um, I would argue that uh, one is a little bit more optimistic than the other. That doesn't mean one is wrong or the other is right. It just, uh, they, they are both good papers and they could lead one to different directions. But we ought to understand what do we mean by international order. International order can mean the distribution of power in a system, 
but it also can mean the normative framework of a system. And I'm taking it in that second sense. Uh, Henry Kissinger, in his book on international order, uh, says we have to realize there has never been a global world order, ever. People say, oh, well, after 1945, you had the American hegemony and American international order. Well, you know, American hegemony was never hegemony in the sense of being able to control everything. And it, even, even then, it was at best a half hegemony. It didn't cover more than half the world. China was outside. Uh, India was outside. The Soviet <coughs> Union was outside. So this much vaunted liberal international order, sometimes called Pax Americana or American hegemony, was at best uh, a half Pax Americana or a half hegemony. And even when we had that type of, uh, contr of power, um, notice there are things we couldn't control. We couldn't prevent the Soviets from taking, uh, invading Hungary in 1956, or we couldn't win the Vietnam War. So uh, we don't want to exaggerate the extent to which the so-called liberal international order was liberal or global or even an order. Um, but with that said, it, it did provide a solution to one of the things that Karim mentioned, which is the provision of global public goods uh, for the reasons that he uh, illustrated. Uh, public goods are hard to provide in, uh, because of the free rider program problem. If I'm going to get the benefits, why should I pay? And if I'm small, I'll get the benefits or not get the benefits, no matter whether I pay. What we do about that in domestic societies, we have governments tax people to pay for schools and roads and so forth. But there's no government internationally for that. So the question is, how do you get provision of global public goods? And the answer has been that uh, large powers, which are large enough that they can see whether they, uh, if they put money into a global public good, they can see the benefits, and if they don't put money into it, they'll feel the absence, that much of the extent to which you have global public goods, it's provided by large powers. People often say in the 19th century, um, Britain provided uh, freedom of the seas, uh, it provided a degree of open international trade and a degree of monetary stability based on a gold standard centered on the finance center of London. These were good for Britain. That's why Britain did it. It wasn't out of charity. But they also were good for many other countries. In that sense, it, they became uh, global public goods. And basically, what happened after Britain was terribly weakened by World War I, it no longer was able to provide global public goods, it couldn't afford it, and the Americans had become the world's largest economy in 1900, but they were still living in a world in which they thought like a small country or thought like an isolated country, and they failed to step in to help provide global public goods in the 20s and 30s. And the net result was that you had a nobody providing global public goods, and you had a decade of deep depression, of uh, genocide, and prelude to World War II. So that in 1945, uh, people like Franklin Roosevelt and Harry Truman and the people who advised them said, we can no longer pretend that we can escape through isolation in the Western Hemisphere. And this led to the creation of the so-called Bretton Woods institutions, the Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and so forth, uh, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, which is the predecessor of the WTO in 47, and the security dimensions in the formation of NATO in 49, the Marshall Plan for European Recovery in 48, and so forth. And this did uh, provide a degree of public goods 
for large parts of the world, not the whole world, but parts of the world. Now, today, many people are saying that's over. And they're saying that with the rise of China, uh, the US is in decline, and the US can no longer provide these goods, so we're facing a period of chaos. Now, there are two things wrong with this assertion, though it's a very popular assertion. One is, I don't think the US is in decline. Um, and the other is, I think China may be willing to help in providing some of these global public goods. Why do I think the US is not in decline? Well, if you look at American politics like right now, it is quite miserable, frankly. Um, uh, you could be very pessimistic about uh, uh, the current administration. But if you take a longer term perspective, looking out, let's say, uh, uh, oh, I don't know, a decade or four or five years, whatever you want, um, the US has some very strong capabilities which are independent of Donald Trump. For example, uh, comparing the US and China, in demography, China's workforce has peaked and is declining. The United States is the only developed country which is going to keep its share of the world population in 2015, according to UN demographers. We're now number three. Today, the countries rank in demography, uh, China, India, US. In 2050, it's going to be India, China, US. But the reason that US role is important is it means that the burden of a labor force, which is young enough to support the old folks like me, is, uh, is not going to be beyond our capacities as it will be for countries like Russia, for much of Europe, for Japan, and so forth. So that's an asset that suggests the Americans not in decline. A second asset is energy. If you look at um, American imports of energy, uh, particularly oil in, uh, let's say, 10 years ago, you would have said the United States is in hopeless decline. It's dependent upon more and more upon imported energy. Uh, how can it be a powerful independent country? Go back to these charts that you saw in, in uh, 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 Karen's uh, paper. Uh, the US is in decline. Today, the International Energy Agency in Paris projects that North America will be largely energy independent in the 2020s. And that's because of the innovation of uh, fracking of shale gas. And that really depended on combining two technologies, a horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing, which unleashed gas in shale rock, which had been there all the time, but the technology suddenly made a huge difference. So if you compare that to China, China is increasingly dependent upon imported energy, particularly uh, Middle East energy. Now, you say, but China has shale too. It does, but alas, it doesn't have enough water, and the shale's not in the <coughs> right places to provide energy independence for China. So demography, energy, a third would be technology. If you look at the technologies that are crucial for the 21st century, uh, such as biotechnology, nanotechnology, uh, the next generation of information technology, including artificial intelligence. And you ask what country is at the forefront of all three? It's the United States. And if you say, can it sustain it? Well, if you look at the ranking of universities, research universities, by Shanghai Jiao Tong University, it looks at the top 20 universities in the world, and it shows that 15 of the 20 are in the United States. None are in China. So this view that somehow China has passed us or is about to pass us that leads to these very pessimistic projections 
by, for example, my colleague at Harvard, Graham Allison, has written a book about U.S. and China called Destined for War. I think he's wrong, and I've told him this, though he's a good friend. Um, I think the key question is not is the U.S. in decline and China going to pass us, which will lead to a 1914 situation. I think the key question is will China begin to do its share of providing these global public goods, or will China act like the United States did in the 1930s? If China doesn't grow up uh, to its new responsibilities, and if it acts like the U.S. did very selfishly in the 1930s, we could be in for a difficult time in global politics, which is an inadequate provision of global public goods. There was some progress being made in this direction. If you look at the agreement reached between the U.S. and China in, at Paris in 2015, and you compare that to the fact that the U.S. and China had been unable to agree on climate at the UN conference at Copenhagen in 2009, you'll see that uh, it is possible to do what Karim has outlined in his paper, to see China and the US competing but cooperating at the same time. Indeed, one of the things that worries me is that right now there's too much emphasis on what some people call a new Cold War between the United States and China. If I'm correct, and China's not about to pass the United States, as Britain had already been passed by Germany in the year 1900, then we have time actually to manage the relationship to China. And that means that you can imagine reaching agreements on cooperation whether it be global climate change or whether it be trafficking in persons or many other areas. Yes, there will be areas where we not agree. For example, uh, when you come to the issue of the South China Sea, where China rejected the finding of the International uh, Court of Arbitration at The Hague uh, and continues to pour sand on rocks, reefs, and atolls in the South China Sea, which the Law of the Sea Treaty, which China has signed, says doesn't give you a territorial sea. You can say there's a conflict between the U.S. and China. The Americans insist on sailing ships called freedom of navigation operations through 12-mile limits that China declares, and that can be confrontational. On the other hand, when it comes to issues like climate or trafficking, there's no reason that countries can't cooperate. Uh, I have been trying in the things I've been writing in meetings I've been going to in Washington and so forth, to say that the United States has got to think about the relationship with China as not a new Cold War, but as a cooperative rivalry where it's equally important to pay attention to the cooperative part and the rivalry part. When it comes to defense and alliance, China has disputes with many of its neighbors, and those neighbors want the American presence. There's reason that Japan has 50,000 American troops in Japan, and what's more, that it pays for them voluntarily because it doesn't want to be left alone with a rising China and no defense. So that hard power alliance part of the relationship is crucial. But at the same time, we and Japan and Europe, including Turkey, are going to need to cooperate if we're going to deal with climate change. Climate change is going to have a tremendous effect upon all of us over time. And that's an area where we have to look not at the rivalry side, but at the cooperative side. So I've been trying to get people to think of the next aspect of the international order, not along Mearsheimer's view of this is over because two-thirds of the states are authoritarian, uh, 
but to think of it more as a cooperative rivalry. What's more, I think Mearsheim was wrong by including Russia as one of the great powers. If you look at Russia, uh, it's tactically very successful in inserting itself in the disputes, but it's a country in demographic decline, and two-thirds of its exports are dependent upon energy, and it hasn't been able to reach the level of, uh, of innovation in the world of artificial intelligence and high technology that other countries have. So I don't think Mearsheim is right on his two-thirds rule, but even if he were, I think the key question is how do we manage to do cooperation at the same time that we are realistic uh, in uh, terms of the fact that balance of power and concerns will continue. So as I look forward or look ahead to what's the nature of the international order, I think it will persist for some time. I think it's going to have to change as China grows in power. But I'm particularly encouraged by these papers which say that uh, uh, there may be areas of cooperation. And as I've written in a recent article in the uh, uh, journal International Affairs, which is published by Chatham House in, uh, in uh, London, uh, as I look ahead, I think the international order will continue. But if you ask me what's my greatest fear, I have more fear of the rise of Trump than I have of the rise of China. So let me end there. Now, I'm sure there will be a lot of questions because the hegemonic, this, the, the, the definition of hegemonic power, these fluctuations, and the way that Mearsheimer and nice different views were discussed, were what we were discussing in the classes on the IRQ in the last two weeks. So I'm expecting good questions from the graduate students in IR theory class. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> So we are open for a Q&A. Özgür, and he's our dean, so he's not, he's off the hook. I don't know much about international I think it's about Russia actually problems, so my question is going to be very Professor Nye, you in his talk mentioned, uh, is this, yeah, it is. Okay, so he, he mentioned that there will be issues where major powers are going to have identical preferences and then there are gonna be issues where they compete with each other. Uh, so Kerim Can laid out this very nice theory where collective action problems among minor powers can be solved through uh, you know, inter uh, interaction with major powers. However, competition between major powers can dampen that effect. Um, my question is, how this relates to the case that, that, that you analyzed, Kerim Jan. Um, now, if regarding human trafficking, China and US has identical preferences, uh, then the result that you obtain, that you know, in, an increase in the influence of China not uh, affecting um, the, the outcome wouldn't be a problem, right? So I don't know whether you, you, you talk about this in your paper. I wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Sure. So the thing about uh, human trafficking is we are pretty sure that China actually does not care about this problem at all. I mean, it, it, the U.S. does, and it wants the, the world to improve in general, uh, you know, combat human trafficking. The, China does not. It does not care about uh, human trafficking inside its own borders. So there's a lot of human trafficking within countries, including China. China does not take um, uh, action there. Neither does China care about international human trafficking. The, theoretically, the problem in this case is, now although these countries do not have conflicting interests, China's indifference to the problem could still weaken the US in the sense that if China provides alternative finance to a country like Turkey, where at the same time that the US is pushing for reforms and saying, look, if you don't make the reforms, you may lose some finance. Now, if China's alternative source is completely cheap 
that Turkey can simply turn over to China, get the same kind of financial assistance without actually making these cumbersome re reforms, Turkey will actually do that. So the China and the US can actually undermine each other, even in areas where they're not directly competing. But that the, the crucial assumption there is that China, as an alternative source, will be willing to provide funding to countries around the world that is essentially politically cheap, that it doesn't want something significant in return. And this is not something I went into uh, in the presentation, luckily, because I was already way out of, you know, uh, above time. the time limit. <laughs> <laughs> right. But the thing is, China actually doesn't provide free aid. China has its own concerns. China has its own priorities. And when, for instance, a country like Singapore gets a lot of aid or Malaysia from, the, from uh, China, what they later find that these uh, financial aid, these trade deals and so on, come with unexpected consequences. Sometimes these are called uh, debt traps that you know, they, they trap countries into debt uh, with China and that this is in fact very costly. So if China is indifferent to human trafficking, an issue area where the US wants improvement, where China wants to provide aid, but it's still costly for the countries, for countries like Turkey, Turkey might say, well, yes, this is, you know, reforming is costly. You're losing the kids. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if I ever had them, actually. So. Um, so considering these two kinds of costs, you might still arrive at an outcome, which is what I think happens here, where the U.S. can continue to uh, push for reform, even if the uh, even if its interest or uh, uh, yeah interests are not directly contradicting China. Thank you, Thank you. We have a question from Damla in the back. She, you, you need a microphone. So the microphone is coming. And Damla is 2017 Sabanji PhD and now in assistant prophet at Ivan Sadar University. Go ahead, Damla. Thank you, John. Um, I have two short questions. Uh, maybe Kerim Jan, you can also respond to one of them first. Don't uh, ask it to Kerim Jan. You okay. can ask it later on, yes. but we have very limited time with Professor yes. Nye. Uh, to Professor Nye, of course, first of all. Uh, how do you see the role of the Asian Infrastructure and Investment Bank in the future of the international liberal order? Um, do you think it will change the role or the power of the World Bank in trade countries? Uh, this is uh, one of the main discussions because Turkey is also part of the, uh, it's, it's in the one of the members of the AIB in Turkey. And my second question, if you have time, how do you see the role of the European Union again in the future of the international liberal order? Because as we all know, it is all it has also its own political and economic problems uh, at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dalit. Yeah. I'll take another question for Professor Nye. I'll take three questions and then we can uh, turn to them. So Eileen, Babak, and Ara. So let's start with Eileen. Uh, the microphone is coming. Eileen is a PhD student in her final year at Sabanja. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. It's been amazingly informative for us working on global governance, or trying to work on global governance. Um, so I was reading Robert Kagan's Brookings report, as well as your paper on international affairs. Um, he mentions that the liberal international order and its norms and principles are critical to uphold for us because they're <coughs> the only things that keep us from burning from the stake or uh, it gives us our freedom basically to think and, and act. Uh, additionally, you say that the provision of public goods and the collective exercise of power is what we should be concerned about, um, especially considering global governance. So if we think about these two ideas in context, how can we reconcile this with the rising populism uh, and Trump-type leadership? Uh, what, what, what is it that should be done in global governance? So that would be Thank fine. you. And I'll pass the floor to Babek. Babek joined us last year from Arizona University, and he's an assistant professor with uh, us. Hello. Uh, uh, thank you for the great presentation. I have a question from Professor Nye, and hope, ho hopefully your responses sort of mitigate the concerns that we have about the attacks against the liberal international norms. Uh, 
sort of I do not share the optimism that you have regarding you know the uh, you know that the liberal order will survive for a couple of reasons. The first of is Trump administration. So we have people like John Bolton, uh, and we know his famous three no uh, paper and policies regarding the institution like international criminal courts. So we have those people that do, they they believe in not only not cooperating with international organizations, but also attacking them and destroying them and weakening them totally. So it's th their attitude toward the international organization. Also regarding the domestic politics of the US, politics of the US, I think, uh, uh, for example, you mentioned about demography. Uh, I think if we go to different universities, all of these technology related schools that we have in the US, uh, most of these universities are benefiting from um, mostly immigrants, you know, Turks, Iranian, Indian, Chinese, that they are studying, producing, and helping to develop technologic uh, advancement uh, in, in, the, in, in the US. But regarding this anti-immigrant, uh, uh, you know, um, wave that we have in the US as actually presented by, by uh, President Trump and his administration, so that's the main concern. I think the demography idea that you have and mentioned, I think, would be a little here um, sort of uh, in, in question. And the second w one would be that uh, regarding uh, energy also, China is doing much better in comparison to the US. We know that President Obama passed um, some laws and regulations and uh, allocated many funding for new uh, uh, technologies, um, uh, you know, uh, green technology. But we know that uh, President Trump reversed all of those uh, regulations, all of those fundings. Now China is the leader of uh, sort of uh, producing new technology, green technology, uh, having one of the, uh, actually the biggest, uh, you know, solar panel farm in the world. So I think China is moving toward being less dependent on, um, you know, classic traditional oil energy. Uh, so these are my concerns sort of uh, regarding uh, the, the arguments that you had and the optimism that you have about liberal uh, order. order. Thank you, Babek. Thank and you. we have a question from Ara. So you have the EU, you have the unit level, system level, and then Chinese uh, challenges. Okay, Ara. Um, I have a professor, nice, uh, the great honor to ask me a question in person, first of all. And my question is not your dispute with John Mearsheimer, but with Graham Ellison, <laughs> and is uh, El Graham Ellison's concept of Thucydides trap is examining of 14 cases starting with Athens Spartan dispute uh, and came to the Cold War and he examines that in a system where there is an already existing hegemon and what what's the consequences of an, another rising power and sadly 14 14 cases 12 of 14 cases ended up with war and China is uh, expanding massively from last decade their expansion in South Asian Sea, Belt Road and Initiative projects and, and other daring projects. And what makes you think that the uh, Chinese and American uh, trying to be a hegemon in the system won't end up with a massive conflict? Is it the deterrence effect that both two possess? Because in the history, there has been never been this massive deterrence effect. Thank you. Thank you, Ara. And Ara is a junior student, junior level student. Then. Special double major, the double, you're a double major, right? In political science and international studies, he's also a double agent. So <laughs> I'll turn to. <laughs> uh, well, lots of good questions. Let me uh, try to answer quickly. Um, on the AIIB, uh, I've never been very bothered about it. Uh, it's if you set, if China sets up a fund which has an external board of directors. It means it can't use its uh, economic aid as a slush fund to bribe dictators as easily as it otherwise does. Um, and I think uh, in that sense, uh, the Americans made a mistake of opposing AIAB. In fact, Obama himself said that that was a mistake. So I, AIAB, uh, uh, you know, my view, a good thing. Um, uh, on the role of EU, I think EU is actually plays a very important role. If you look at issues like uh, antitrust or privacy and so forth, uh, EU is uh, setting the norms for the world. 
Uh, when Mark Zuckerberg testified before Congress, he said we should think about the GDPR and bring it into the US. Now there are lots of difficulties in detail with that, but the argument that, I mean, the EU is, uh, uh, you know, the, an economy the size of the American economy. It's bigger than the Chinese economy. Uh, and uh, the EU has a very important role. And uh, I think uh, uh, we should be doing a lot more to improve the relations we have with the EU. Um, on uh, Kagan and authoritarianism, I've never, I was not quite taken with the Kagan argument. Um, I strongly agree with Bob Kagan about the importance of human rights, and um, uh, I don't, but I don't see authoritarianism as a unified movement the way he does. Uh, it's not like the 1930s or the 1950s when you had fascism or communism. One of the odd things about populist nationalism is it's self-containing. It usually is in opposition to somebody else. It's very hard to, uh, to sort of join forces with an authoritarian international when like, uh, let's say, Orban in Hungary, you think it's uh, Orban Uberalis. And uh, so I don't, see, uh, I don't see this happening. Or if you want another way of example of it, uh, uh, in the 1950s, uh, Mao, uh, was an ideologue, and he had people marching in the streets and jungles in South America uh, under a banner of Maoism. Show me the place in the world where people today are marching in the streets or jungles under the banner of Xi Jinping thought about socialism with Chinese characteristics. That's the official title, which is enshrined in the constitution of the Communist Party. It doesn't exactly turn people on. So authoritarianism is a problem, but the authoritarian international that Kagan talks about, I think is an exaggeration. Um, on the uh, question of uh, the liberal international order and Trump, I do think Trump is a threat to the liberal international order. I've written several places that uh, I think that Trump's actions are more endangering to the liberal international order than the rise of China. Uh, and I think uh, even though the Americans may remain the most powerful country, I expect they will, if you don't use your power, uh, then somebody else will. And indeed, the Americans were the most powerful country in the 1930s and didn't use their power. And the result was what W.H. Auden called the low dishonest decade of the 1930s. So uh, that's why I do worry about Trump. On Trump and immigration, uh, if Trump were able to truly cut back on immigration, as opposed to using it as a populist issue to mobilize his base, uh, I would worry very much. I don't think he can. The American people are a nation of immigrants, and we benefit enormously from immigrants. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt, when he addressed the daughters of the American Revolution, who were people who were so proud that they went back to the uh, Mayflower and so forth, he opened his address to them, uh, fellow immigrants. And uh, that's what we all are, except for a very small portion of people who were indigenous to the country. I once had a discussion with Lee Kuan Yew, the former prime minister and minister mentor of Singapore, and I said, uh, what do you think? Do you think that China is going to surpass the US? He said, no. He said, uh, I don't think they're going to pass you. They're going to give you a run for your money. He says, they can call in talents of 1.3 billion people, which was the number at the time. He said, but the United States can call on the talents of seven billion people, and then it can recombine them with a diversity which is never possible with ethnic Han nationalism. I think there's something in that. I don't think Trump can reverse that. I think we're going through a bad cycle, but I don't think it's, it's going to be reversed. On the question of uh, 
China and uh, uh, solar and wind energy, uh, and I should add nuclear, China is also moving on nuclear, I, I applaud that. Um, th th this is a case where when we think about power, we too often think of power over other countries, and we don't spend enough time in thinking power with other countries. For the Americans to do well in achieving our objectives in preserving our coastal cities, China has to do well. So the better China does, the better for us. It's win-win. So uh, I wish the United States uh, would return to the position that Obama had in terms of cooperating with China in this. I suspect they will. When you look at the public opinion polls in the US, you'll see that the younger generation is very concerned about uh, issues of climate change. Uh, so I suspect that what you're seeing with the Trump period is uh, something that's going to pass with generational change. Uh, and then finally on uh, my friend Graham Allison and Thucydides, um, let me point out to you, uh, first of all, that the number that Graham uses, 12 out of 16 cases, of a rising power and of established power uh, leading to war is a phony number, and I've told him this. There aren't 16 cases, there are many more 16 cases. Go back and look at the question in the 1860s of why Britain didn't resist the rise of Prussia. There's no question Britain was the dominant state in 1860s. Uh, Britain had an opportunity to fight for Denmark as Prussia attacked Denmark to begin the unification of Germany, and it didn't. So how does he explain that? He left the case out, couldn't explain it. Instead, he treats it all as one big case and it ends in 1914 and goes to war. Well, you know, that's a, that's a gross oversimplification of history because in 1898, for example, the most likely war in Europe was not between Germany and Britain, it was between Britain and France after the confrontation at Fashoda in Africa. So to treat history the way he treats it and to say 12 out of 16 cases is a, a, a misuse of history. And he's a friend of mine and I've told this to him. I, I said, I'll never say something about your work behind your back, I wouldn't say it to your face. But that's, that is my view on this. As for the Thucydides trap, uh, remember the proposition that Thucydides had was the Peloponnesian War was caused by the rise in the power of Athens and the fear it created in Sparta. There are two sides to that, rise and fear. We can't stop the rise of China. We can moderate the amount of fear in the United States. And by publishing a book with the title Destined for War, that just exacerbates the fear side of it and I think is the wrong way to approach it. So uh, even though I can have a close friend, I can disagree with a close friend and I think it's important as I said last night, uh, as we think about the roles of universities, academic freedom and intellectual integrity is the hallmark of what makes a good university and politics, friendship notwithstanding. Now we can actually, if it's okay for you, uh, release Professor Nye for his other appointment. He's uh, yeah, you're, you're waiting there. But we can continue the discussion. Now, Damla Jim, your question on Kerem John and everything that we, no, we got no questions for because it's a very interesting paper. So after Professor and I leaves, I'll hold you for about 10 or 15 minutes and we can, discuss, we can continue the discussion there. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And again, my congratulations to uh, this great pair of young scholars. Thank you. Thank you so much. You so much. Yes, okay. exactly. Okay. Good. Have, enjoy Thank your visit today. Thank you. Okay. Now, Damla, your question to Kerem John. And you can come a bit forward if you want to.
Yeah, yeah, come, come. Come. Uh, AIB, but the many EU member states that we know, they are also members of the institution. So do you think um, the, this Western contribution or the, um, to, the, to the establishment of this institution is going to make much more legitimate the use of aid or uh, fund uh, for, for third countries which are illiberal in, in a sense, uh, do you think, or it can create another way uh, or another area of cooperation with China and the West, maybe with the US in the future as well. Thank you. Right. Should I answer? Or? Yes, yes, please. Oh, okay. So what, what I think happens there is probably it will limit the West's ability to make big demands from third countries, okay? So when you look at something like human trafficking, it is, a, as I said, it is, it requires costly reforms from countries, but it's not as costly as changing your regime type, you know, holding democracy or holding elections and risking being removed from power. So that's a much bigger demand. If the US or the West in general makes these kinds of demands, rather than taking the West's money and making the democratization reforms, the countries will move to China or Russia or anywhere else because that is what the governments want more than anything else in most cases to remain in power. Whereas for more limited aims like the uh, human trafficking uh, regime, I think uh, these two sources of power, China and the West, can coexist because, as I said, it's not incredibly costly to make these reforms and frankly aid from China is not uh, free either. So I think there is a scope condition there. WTO, Babak? Yeah, on, on for Cosette. Okay, so Babak. Uh, thank you very much. Cosette, um, uh, I have a question as we, you briefly uh, chat uh, last night, talk about that. Uh, I'm interested about how uh, international organization, human rights international organization, address uh, the you know countries or pick up the countries that they are the violator of human rights, and uh, of course there are some some studies on how ICC pick it, picks the cases of you know human rights violation and other what is defined. So this this uh, variable that you define political power, if, if I'm, yeah. So uh, could you tell us uh, if we can uh, apply uh, that measure because it's a very interesting measure and you. Tell us about more about that, and if we can apply that measure in, for example, studying uh, the behavior of international organizations that they are addressing and you know uh, actually focusing on human rights uh, violation. Um, I would be happy to hear about that. We need to turn your mic on. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but they are, they're recording it, so. Okay, um, so I've looked at sort of different ways of measuring the political capital or legitimacy of other organizations um, like the International Criminal Court or the International Court of Justice. I haven't thought so much about how to, how to operationalize that or measure that in the context of, for example, the United Nations and the human rights treaty bodies. Um, I think there, there aren't sort of really institutionalized forums within which these expressions of voice um, can be exercised. I've spent um, this past semester at Perry World House at Penn with the former, former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. And my sense, speaking with him, is that a lot of these expressions of voice are actually manifested within private meetings. And so you don't have that public institutionalized forum um, with the human rights treaty bodies, uh, the human rights committee, for example, um, the committee on the elimination of discrimination against women, as you do with um, these, these more institutionalized forms. So I think it just really depends on institutional design. And that was a choice by UN members to, to not set these up as independent bodies where those sort of signals could be sent publicly. But it happens behind the scenes for, <laughs> by, for all means. Very good, Rashid. Microphone. Thank you. 
I do have a question for Professor Karimjan. I think um, Professor Nai mentioned uh, the, the scenario in which China and US may cooperate, and there are also some scenarios in which they may not. Uh, and your case study, I think, presents a case in which uh, China not necessarily cooperating, but the inaction of China um, doesn't uh, pose a threat to the international system. Now, my question is that, can we really look at these cases independently in the sense that China and US may cooperate in some issue and in another issue they may not? How sure are we that China may not hinge its cooperation on one issue with a dispute it is having with US? So it may say that if you want me to cooperate and you really want this, so if it realizes that US really wants something, it may say that if you really want me to cooperate, then you, sh you should give me this because uh, this is what I do want as well. So it, w it may use that to its own advantage and wouldn't that likely lead to um, a crisis if US refuses to give that uh, which China is requesting? Okay, so that's actually a very good question, and that goes into something that I didn't uh, mention in the presentation, but actually Joseph Nye did. So the very last part of the abstract, and I think the very last part of the paper says, look, if this uh, kind of coexistence, this um, uh, you know, increasing rivalry actually gets worse, okay, and turns into a more zero-sum conflict like the one that, uh, that was between the Soviet Union and the USA, these kinds of examples will disappear because during the Cold War what we had was these countries, uh, the, the, the two great powers almost in never, they never were uh, non-interfering with each other. They were actually very anxious and they did their best to poach from the other side any allies that they could, okay? So if you have that kind of thing where China and the US think, oh, if I can get one of their allies at whatever cost, I see that as a gain and vice versa, then this kind of uh, coexistence will disappear. The nice thing is that currently we don't have that. You can have cases where China is not willing to pay any cost to just to get someone uh, away from the US. And you can have, you know, so if you're a country like Turkey, to get some concessions from China, you still have to make some concessions back. So it's not very easy for smaller countries to play the two great powers against each other. But if it turns into something like you suggested, where every kind of cooperation or non-interference is negotiated, it's a very zero-sum game, then uh, it will be like the Cold War, and none of these non-interference cases will uh, will be uh, will exist then. Yeah, poor Professor Nice. The signing books outside. <laughs> 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 okay, Selim. Thank you, and Cosette, I have a question for you. Uh, like, I think it's a very interesting paper because World Trade Organization is relatively less studied in judicial politics too, as far as I know. Um, you promised that you could talk a little bit more about methodology if there are any questions from the QA session. And I would like to hear about more, and because there's also a lot of arguments about the, the disadvantages of automatic content analysis as well. So how did you apply it? What were the limitations? Um, so thank you for that. What was your name again? Selin. Um, so I tried a number of different methods, and I was speaking with Alan at lunch yesterday about this as well, methods and methodologies to try to capture this and to really just validate the measure that I was using. Um, so I first started out with just qualitative coding with, um, with two researchers, right, to actually develop my coding scheme of critical, supportive, neutral, and other. Um, and then after that, tried to train or use the, the sort of the qualitative coding part of it um, to train algorithms to be able to identify and classify individual statements into these four categories. And I actually found that 
for a broad range of text tools that they weren't um, very valid in terms of those classifications. And so I used, I ultimately used what's uh, called a proportion classification technique. Um, it's an application call or a program called README. And so I, it doesn't actually classify individual statements, it classifies um, uh, all, a, a group of statements into proportions or percentages. Um, and then just cross-validate, 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 do a number of external validation tests. That's really the only way to sort of increase the certainty of the measures that we're using. Um, and then in, in, other, in another paper that's, uh, I forget where it's placed, it's published somewhere, um, we took the, the statements that are just about the rulings themselves and used a battery of coders and researchers um, to, to qualitatively and manually code each one, and then compare that to what README was telling me, and, and the, the cross-validation score was about 98%, was actually really, really high. Um, but I'm happy to send you the paper, the appendix has more details on the methods. But I agree, there's a lot of skepticism about these types of methods and, and text analysis methodologies. Um, they're only as good as sort of spam filters, right? And you know spam filters that sort of take emails that are, that are you know, advertisements and put them in your spam folder, we all know they don't work all the time. Um, and so that's why cross-validation is really important. Okay. I don't remember your name because we never met. <laughs> I know you by face. So Max. Your, Max. His name is Max. He's in, you're in comp program, though. I was, actually. I graduated. Why are you still here? <laughs> hey, what? <laughs> <laughs> I'm still here because I'm working on campus as a professional. Ah, okay. Very good. Place, Sorry. Yes. A recent graduate from the Conflict yeah. Resolution Program. Thank Thank you for the presentations, and my question will be about the work of Kerem Janoja. Uh, now that Joseph Nye is gone, I can be as realist as I, as I can get. Yes. So, um, in your presentation, you talked about three you know, areas where you said international cooperation makes sense, or is it like required? And the first one was the one you discussed, you know, human trafficking, and then came like civil wars and then climate change. Uh, with the first one, I think, you know, cooperation makes sense because it's like, you know, about prestige and you can just, you know, focus on a more liberal, you know, uh, approach that you can make use of when it comes to analyzing international developments. But when it comes to climate change and or civil wars, we will have to, you know, talk about national interest as well. What I'm trying to, you know, ask is what is your, you know, position on the idea that just because we have more national interests, it will be more difficult for us to you know, make a logical connection between the US criticism on the one hand and the great rivalry on the other and the outcome of you know, uh, cooperation. Thank you. Right. Okay, so um, I guess, now climate change is a very interesting case because until recently under the previous administration, the US was one of the leaders uh, in that issue area, but this administration has completely abandoned it. And China now says that we, they might uh, want to pick up the, the, the mantle, okay? Um, I think the, the, the framework broadly applies that you need a hegemon or a dominant power to get other countries to cooperate in combating climate change. Um, and if there is a rival power under certain conditions, the rival may be weakening the, the dominant power's you know, efforts at getting cooperation. Um, as you suggested, the cost of um, reforming or cost of adapting, uh, let's say, national economy to um, to to be making it more environmental is is higher. Um, sending your peacekeepers to intervene and stop other place, civil wars in other places are they're more costly. They're costlier. So probably in these instances, even if you have a dominant force, a, a hegemon pushing for cooperation, it will be difficult, with or without an alternative great power, you know, meddling. Um, all else equal, it will be a harder problem than human trafficking. Um, but I think the framework uh, broadly applies. Uh, a great power, an alternative great power, if it's not interfering, uh, may not actually make things even more difficult. But if it is in a kind of uh, zero sum game and you know willing to uh, you know undermine the other at all costs it will actually make things 
much more difficult. I think that's the, the, the framework still applies.